Hello Brains. One of my favorite things about doing this channel is I not only get to learn all the cool tools and strategies and stuff from research and other ADHD experts, but I get a lot from the community itself. I have probably heard about more tools and strategies than anybody else on the planet at this point, and I thought it'd be really cool to share some of those with you. If you haven't seen it already, we have a free Notion template called ADHD Toolbox with strategies from our channel. You can check out the video where I talk about that here and a link to it in the description below. But for this video, I thought it would be cool to do an add-on toolkit to that template of strategies that we've learned from the community, some of our favorites. I thought it would be cool to like meet one-on-one -on -one with people and talk to them about their strategies. And it was a really cool, really fun experiment. We have a lot that we like. We have a bunch in the template, which we'll talk about later in the video. But for now, these are five of my favorite uh, ADHD strategies that are community sourced. So first up, Rubik's Cube as a fidget from Glenn. I knew a lot of people with ADHD use Rubik's Cubes as fidgets. What I didn't know was how they learned to do this or why exactly this was their go-to. Glenn talked about not just how he learned to do the Rubik's Cube, which uh, was a lot easier than I would have expected, but also when he uses it and how. He said he taught it to himself in an hour. And so I'm gonna link in the description um, the site that he used to teach himself, and I will show you uh, what he does with it here. I use my Rubik's Cube to help me uh, focus and redirect my energy so I'm not quite so intense when I speak to others. It allows you to be a lot, but not all in the same direction, right? It, you're putting some of your energy over here and some of your energy over here. It can take um, anywhere from like you know, um, a minute to five minutes to solve it. And then for me, the reward is I get to mess it up again. Did you say a minute to five minutes? Because I'm yeah. pretty sure that it's taken me years and I still haven't figured it out. There's a really good wiki out there on, uh, on solving it. And it's just the same repetitive things again and again and again. And so you can talk to somebody and also, uh, if you're looking at the cube, you don't have to look at them, you know, and they don't catch on. You know, it's like they have problems with eye contact. Oh. You know, nobody thinks twice about it. You know, that um, makes but sense. it's, you know, you solve the bottom, then the middle, and then the top, and again and again and again. It's like if I'm too much for people, then um, then I can focus more on thinking about how to combine steps, how to, okay, where does where is this one turning, or where is this one going, how is it turning, and all that. And I can focus a little bit more, and it helps me dial it down a little bit. Or if I'm being hard on myself or I'm too anxious to whatever, I can do the same thing. You know, I just kind of get more into my own head space and th this helps. This works as a fidget, even if you're not solving it. Well, you kind of get their curiosity if you're standing here spinning it. They look on it with interest and then um, they're almost celebrate when you solve it and then you scramble it right away. And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, minimum viable product or process by Kira. I knew about this concept of the minimum viable product, which is what is the minimum usable thing that we can create here uh, and as a way of combating perfectionism. What I hadn't thought of is applying that to processes. Kira and I both use the Marie Kondo style of folding laundry, um, which is great when you go to pick out your shirt or pants or whatever because everything's vertical and you can see where it is and so you don't end up like digging through piles and, and throwing clothes everywhere. But folding it does take time. And Kira has a really cool minimum viable process for getting to that point. When it's something that's collaborating with other people, I find that it, it helps with like letting go of a sense of attachment because you haven't invested like hours and hours and hours and hours. So if you do like some, like some a little bit, you know, and then you get some feedback on that and it's a collaboration from earlier on, it feels less like you're insulting all my work. <laughs> so uh, give me an example of how you use it outside of work my laundry folding process i mean it used to just be a total nightmare as i think it is for a lot of us or just like you have this mound and you take like a thing at a time and then you fold it and it's just like okay great i still have this mound as a starting point i sort so rather than going right straight into folding oh. i sort it all literally just sorting it all like just around wherever like wherever i would fold it and it would help me to feel like a sense of motivation. I get this little like dopamine hit every time I finish a pile. Yeah, because it makes it possible to finish something. You haven't finished folding and putting away all the laundry, but you've finished sorting and then you finished this pile and then you finished this pile. So then I got these bins. <laughs> I just sleep with the laundry like every night. There's laundry <laughs> all over my bed. You know, if it's like I really just like run out of time, you know, I can be like, you know, Tyler, here are your shirts. <laughs> the goal for me is not like 
take like the least possible amount of time. It's to like give it the flexibility. So like if I have less time, it's not like I'm totally like stuck and it just keeps piling up and up and up and up. Then it's nice to have that flexibility where if you have the time to and you're able to do the parts of it that you really enjoy, great. But if not, it's still functional for you. Three, clothing cubbies from Pi, whose mom is an occupational therapist and helped them set it up. I've heard a lot from this community that it's not ideal to have your clothes be in a dresser because first of all, out of sight, out of mind. But second of all, it's just, it's extra steps, right? Having to open the open the drawer and then put things in and close the drawer, it's more steps. So a lot of people use a clothing rack in their room or like pie, clothing cubbies. I thought this was a really cool way of having everything organized while still being able to see it and easily access it when you need it. And yeah, if you're wondering if that is a Chewbacca mask that Pi is wearing, yes, yes, it is. It's super cool. <laughs> I always had a hamper of like wear again, like not dirty clothes. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to put them in the dresser because like weird and like I didn't want to put them in the hamper. So like everything that, that's like clean or wear again goes like back on the shelf. If it smells, it goes in the hamper. Or if I like spilled coffee on it, which is most of the days, just goes in the hamper. Cold weather pajamas. Um... Hot weather pajamas. And my random shark suit. Really, who doesn't need a shark suit? All this is like socks and underwear and stuff that needs to be kind of contained. Okay, I love this for so many reasons. Um, first of all, yeah, you're putting things where you can see them. But also, you have your own organizational system. It makes absolutely no sense to anybody else. But you know where everything is. Things are organized. Things are folded. The things that need to be contained are contained. And don't move it or I will have no idea where it is. Four, compassionate hand by John. So people with ADHD have really big feelings and a lot of those feelings are negative. Guilt and shame and rejection sensitivity. We have these big negative emotions a lot of the time. So John talked about this concept of compassionate hand, which is a tool that he learned. I really, really like it. It's fairly simple, but really powerful. I'll let him explain. Simply put, it is just find a comfortable position when you're having a moment where you're struggling a little bit with shame, which is such a common ADHD experience, use a hand on the spot where you feel the pain. So you might do a gentle touch on the chest or on the throat or in your belly. These are the most common spots. And then you infuse it with like warmth and connection. And then you breathe into that. It doesn't change the hurt. It just, it's sort of filling the space around it and wrapping it and giving it, you know, connection. And then just sitting with that as it, as it comes and goes. I'm not a naturally self-compassionate person, so I find having that connection to someone external makes it much easier to breathe and allow that warmth to come and go, to be like, hey, you know, I'm caring, I'm connecting. But yeah, the two things, one is touch, like we're programmed to feel love when we feel touch. But the second part is... Um, yeah, we don't always treat ourselves. Our inner critic's often much worse to herself. So we imagine it's someone else because it's much kinder than we are. One of the things I really like about this is you're not fighting the feeling, right? You're not piling shame on about the shame. You're not trying to get rid of the negative. You're letting the negative exist and dissipate, but you're helping it dissipate a little bit faster by adding something positive, right? Yeah, yeah. And you're being kind and present with it. Five starters from Joe. This is something I've actually used before. A lot of times people with ADHD have trouble starting things. So I have my own version of this that I use for work, but I like the way that Joe uses it. Joe started using this strategy after he realized he wasn't making progress toward things that were really important to him. I think it's brilliant. Um, I've talked before about Ib News. There's a video that you can check out here about that, the things that are important but not urgent, which for us are often the things that never get done. I've talked about the importance of setting aside time, doing time blocking, having accountability, doing body doubling, but Joe has a different strategy, which is making it as easy as possible to start using starters. We definitely have footage for this. We actually had to record this one twice because the first time I didn't actually hit record. So I really should have had a starter for starting to record. That would have been helpful. I would have had a way to check that off. I'll let him explain. And so knowing that for any task I want to take, 
I've put it, I've gotten it down to the literal smallest possible step because the literal smallest possible step for me is launching the starter that tells me what the next step is to get started. And like when I know it's time to do cardio, I know that the first thing I need to do is just launch the note. I don't have to think about anything else. I just do that. And then I just do the things that are in the list. Getting music started is huge for me. Change if I'm not already changed, you know, throw my shoes on. If I'm at home, grab the Peloton key, throw it in the treadmill. If I'm at the gym, I just go straight upstairs to the treadmills. I know that when I get on it, I start walking at a certain incline, at a certain speed, right? Like I get the momentum going. Then I like, okay, now I'm going to open my training. I'm working training for 10K right now. And so I'm trying to like, uh, so I have a specific set of um, workouts that I'm trying to do. So I go and open the plan. I look at it and then, okay, I'm going to start. What I'm trying to do is be more productive and efficient. And so working on the thing that I know I need to do at that moment. So for example, part of the starter will be like, go look at the task list for this specific thing. Find the task that you re previously put at the top as the most important thing to do next and like start work on that thing. I'm, you know, much more effective now at knowing like what it is I'm doing right now and what I should be focused on. And I'm still working on the system. Like I, st I do definitely still need to find a way to like check back in with myself and make sure I'm doing the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but, you know, for the most part, like it's been very, very helpful in, in helping me work on a number of things throughout my day instead of just the one thing that's the most urgent that I need to like, that I've been procrastinating on for weeks that I need to get done today or, or you know, or else. <laughs> Those are five of my favorite, but there were so many other good ones. Snacks on hand, having snacks on hand that are your go-to snacks so you don't have to really think about it when you're hungry. One bag to rule them all, meaning everything that you need to take with you, you just put in one bag and that's the bag you just use. You just take that with you every day. That is a strategy I use quite a bit. Chaining down your keys. I thought this was brilliant. I will be buying one of these for sure. I will link to it in the description below. All of these tools from the community and more tools as well are now in the ADHD toolbox template that we built out on Notion. If you already have the ADHD toolbox, you can just download the add-on toolkit called Community Toolkit. I'll link to both of those in the description below. So yeah, this is Notion. It's a great place to build out templates or to use templates that other people have built. It's basically whatever you want it to be. A lot of creators that I know use it, a lot of people in this ADHD community, and my team loves it as well. We built this community toolkit as an add-on to the ADHD toolbox we created, which you can check out in this video. But basically the ADHD toolbox is a place to keep all the tools and strategies that you know work for you, as well as the tools you found that don't work for you so you don't waste any more time on them. To use the template, you do need to sign up for Notion, but it is free and it's super easy and fast to sign up. I have found it really helpful to bookmark mine so that I can go right to it whenever I need it. So yeah, let me show you how this works. It's divided into categories. My toolbox, tools I wanna try, tools I'm currently testing, tools that might work if, and tools that are not for me. A lot of people have talked about how helpful this toolbox has been and have asked for more tools. So we're planning on continuing to add toolkits like this one over time. And again, if you don't already have the ADHD toolbox, you can download it with the community toolkit preloaded. Once you've got it, you can check out the strategies we've included. Search by type or by what it helps with. You can delete ones you're not interested in, and you can also add your own tools. I hope you find it helpful. And if it's your first time using Notion, I hope you like it as much as we do. If you can think it, you can make it happen with Notion. If you wanna check it out, again, link is in the description below. There were a lot more really great strategies as our team has the bandwidth uh, to and the time to. Uh, we will be adding more to this toolbox template. Again, all of this is free. Check it out on Notion. Thank you so much to Notion for sponsoring this video and basically allowing us to create something super cool and super helpful for this community. We will be adding to it in the future and possibly even reaching out and doing you know more video chats. Um, I love doing this with the community, so it's super fun for me and educational for hopefully everybody, helpful for the community as well. So if you'd like to potentially have yours included, please put it in the comments below. And thank you to my brain advocates and all my Patreon brains for sticking with us and supporting us, allowing us to do innovative new types of content, giving me the time to reach out to the community and do cool videos like this. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, click all the things, and I will see you next video. Bye brains. Oh, and bonus throwback. Glenn, who taught me about the Rubik's Cube, said that he still uses one of these. This is a glitter bottle. This is a super, super old video, but the idea behind this is that you shake up the glitter because, you know, our glitter is sometimes shaken up inside. You shake up the glitter in this bottle, and as this glitter settles, your inner glitter settles too. Ooh. Wow, this really works. <laughs> it's still one of my favorite strategies too. You can check out that video here. Ooh.
Wow, this really works. 